Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We are here for another one of your questions about work. And no, Michael Gerard Tyson is not our guest, but better, better. Ryan, who I've known for almost 10 years now, I think I was like looking and our first emails were like 2013 or something like that. So for those of you who are here for the first time, I'm Roy. I'm a startup investor in the future of work. We take on your questions about work. We especially love having founders we backed. And because this is all public information, I don't mind saying this stuff or at least reported information. The most valuable company in which we have ever invested was started by Ryan, who is the founder and CEO of Flexport, which solves a problem freight forwarding that as a founder, I myself dealt with. And so you started this business in this domain that is not small. It's like how many trillions of dollars of global GDP move through international shipping and other forms of freight and logistics. And so the question is, in a world that's uncertain, how do I, like, what do I do as a business person to deal with uncertainty? Yeah. Hey, Roy, good to see you. And that's an awesome stat. I didn't know we were the largest company Bloomberg Bay ever invested in. So proud of that. Thank you for your support. I, dealing with uncertainty. Well, first of all, I think you got to reframe it. Um, it's uncertainty should be your friend. You want to be, if you, if you organize yourself the right way, you gear your company, your culture, your personal life, your affairs in the right way. Uh, you should be built to thrive on uncertainty and become, uh, if you're better at it than your peers, then you welcome it and you want to be the source of that uncertainty in the world and uh, kind of create chaos for your competition. And, and so that's that's the goal. You have to be better at dealing with uncertainty than your competitors. You don't have to be better uh, at it in an absolute sense, but better than the other people that you compete with and you all come out ahead. Um, I guess the goal is being anti-fragile. It, it, so then who, I mean, I love that. Like I'm here in like Game of Thrones, chaos is a ladder kind of stuff. And I think about it like this moment in the economy. It's like, well, as a VC, this is great news for me that the economy is unstable because all the crappy VCs are all going to get washed out and we can do better. So what are the things that make you, and your point is people tend to compare themselves to how they were doing before there was uncertainty. And while they may be worse, relatively speaking, compared to everybody else, the goal is to be better. And I guess the question is, so how do you do that? Like, what are the things? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think um, probably the best organization in general, when you want to learn something, it's good to find a model. Someone who's done this before, someone that uh, has been down that path and you can and you can learn from them. We're, that's basically the way humans learn is by modeling others. And I think the organization is probably the best at dealing with uncertainty and chaos is, is going to be the military. Uh, the military inherently, you've got what they call the fog of war. Uh, you inherently have no idea what's going to happen. I think... Um, it was Eisenhower who said that uh, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. Um, and the the greatest, um, well, not well known, but probably the most important military theorist of the 21st century, uh, 20, sorry, the 20th century, the last century, um, was a guy named John Boyd. And uh, John, John Boyd, for those who haven't um, learned about him, was a fighter pilot in the beginning and then he went on to develop airplanes. So he developed the F-15 and the F-16. Uh, and he revolutionized the way that we think about air, air combat and dogfighting. He turned it from an art into a science and then turned, built airplanes that would be ideal at operating in, that, in those conditions. Um, and then after that, he went on, uh, he got actually really pissed off at the Air Force and he quit because the Air Force um, intentionally made his design for the F-16 worse so that it would so that they would be able to continue to buy the f-15 they didn't want the wow. f-16 to be strictly better than the f-15 wow. and when they did that he got so pissed that he quit um and he actually became a general theorist uh, he went and become a history read all the history of warfare um built a military theory that he eventually brought back to the marine corps and the marines deployed it as their official strategy and it's uh it, they actually have a, a handbook it's called war fighting um the u.s marine corps and the, the Marine Corps is a really interesting um, organization because they have all of the combined arms. They have ships, they have planes, they have armor, they have infantry. They have, you know, they have it all instead of being siloed like, um, like the Air Force, the Navy, and the Army are. Um, and I think that's a, one interesting principle is to combine people with many different ex uh, forms of experience and competency in your, in your group so that you can deal with. Uh, you know, people have experience in dealing with a range of conditions that you may face. Um, but what Boyd's actual strategy, he ended up becoming the architect of the Gulf War. Um, 
the first Gulf War. And that strategy was literally John Boyd's handbook that he designed for them. Um, and he, he developed a principle called UDA. Uh, and it's observe. This is a principle for dealing with uncertainty. You observe. You have to observe. Be very good at observing the world. Find out what's happening out there. Gather data, lots of information sources. Figure out what's happening. Where, where, what are your, all your, use all your senses to observe the world. Then you have to orient. What does that data mean for your organization? Who needs to know? What are the teams that need to be put together to tackle this problem, to be aware of it, the situation? Who should know? And then that t- who needs to make decisions? That's the D and who does decide and then act. Um, and the concept of an UDA loop, this is a loop. So you take action, then you observe again, what happened with that action? What's the result? The concept here sounds so simple as to be trivial. And when I first learned about this, I ignored it because it was like, yeah, whatever. That doesn't seem that interesting. Um, but the principle is that the organization, the group that is better at executing this loop, not does in many cases it's faster, but in some kind, in some cases you want to go slower while you gather more information and make sure you make high quality decisions. But the group that's better at executing those loops will very quickly be changing the environment through their action faster than the competition can keep up. So they observe, the competitors are still observing the world that has already gone past and changed. And pretty quickly, they become bewildered and are unable to compete, unable to, uh, to maintain morale. And so can I ask uh, a question and- about Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna add one thing. The reason I think the Marine Corps is really interesting is that they are one of the only organizations I'm aware of that can beat you, which is head-on firepower, because it's the U.S. Marine Corps. They've got a lot of it, but they choose instead to use surprise, deception, operations. To cho- they choose to sneak up behind you and, and club you instead of going right at you head-on, even though they could. So. Uh, we want, we all want to be a little bit more like that, more like the samurai. Who's not always the right. most obvious thing. I mean, first of all, I love the use of mili- of history generally and military history in particular in company, in business thinking. Not a lot of people realize how many military concepts. In fact, even the word company is a military word. My word of warning is sometimes then people start thinking that like, you know, whether they answer this customer service ticket is like a life or death thing, which of course mm. can produce some harmful behavior in the workplace. But so let me ask, let me just give a pose one of the recent historical examples to you, which is you're running an international, a company that deals in international logistics. And then there's an international pande- a global pandemic that has a profound and immediate effect on global trade. So how does that way of thinking about bringing together different perspectives, you know, observing, orienting, deciding, and acting, how did that, how did that express itself at a moment of uncertainty for Flexport? Yeah, so um, take us back to um, kind of early 2020. January 2020 was when we first saw stories about the coronavirus hitting in China. And we have a group called flexport.org that does humanitarian response. It does dual mandate, humanitarian response, using logistics to resolve the crises. Uh, Pandemic, this was the first, but we've done many things around earthquakes or refugee camps, things like this, um, hurricanes. And um, and so the first thing we do is activate that group. They uh, they have a task force of volunteers across the company. It has a full-time staff with a budget, but also many, many people um, are trained to how to dial up quickly to support an operation. And we uh, shipped over 300,000 masks to China. I mean, that was embarrassing months later when the United States had no masks, but in the beginning, we didn't really know any better. Uh, we shipped a lot of masks to nonprofits in China dealing with the front line uh, to help the frontline responders over there. Um, very quickly, we realized, hey, there's not enough masks in the United States. Um, and, and it was gonna be obviously hitting really hard. Uh, at the same moment, we learned from our contacts in the air industry, well, they grounded all the passenger planes. And 50% of all the world's freight, air freight, flies in the belly of passenger planes, not on cargo planes. And so at the exact moment we needed as a society, as a civilization to get all of these air, all of these PPE, all these masks and other equipment for doctors into the country, all the airplanes are grounded or half of the airplane, half of the air capacity is grounded. Um, And so we we formed a war room, we formed a task uh, of task force that had daily huddles in the beginning to share data. That's the orient phase. Observe, like we got everybody out there trying to find out, okay, what have you learned? Who's got masks? Turns out there's lots of masks available in Asia, uh, in China mostly. There were lots, they had um, they had really ramped production. There were a lot of masks, but there was no air capacity. And then um, most of the hospitals in the United States didn't know how to import goods. They'd never done it before. They were used to buying goods from a middleman. And so we had, um, 
we kind of formed sub teams to go work with each side of this problem. Um, we had teams that were onboarding hospitals. We onboarded almost every major hospital network in the United States to become an importer, uh, register them with FDA and customs to get them all set up to be able to import these masks, something they'd never done before. Uh, we were able to point them to reliable sources. We were able to raise money. We raised over $10 million um, from philanthropists to be able to ship those masks to the hospitals. Hospitals had their own budgets to do this, so they didn't. we didn't pay for all the masks. But in the end, we shipped almost 500 million units of PPE uh, to frontline responders. And um, the chancellor of one major hospital, actually his wife told me that she was like watching all these Zoom calls that I was that we were on with his team. And she said it was the first time in the beginning of the pandemic when she felt like things were going to be OK, because it had been all out pandemonium in the hospital and at the people chancellor's level. Like, and, organized. and then when they saw that, hey, there's competent people that are working on this and they're going to get the masks in. And we did. We got the mask before they ran out. Uh, and he and the chancellor told me that we saved lives doing that. So we're um, incredibly proud of that. And I think a lot of it was knowing, hey, there's a sense of purpose here. Um, why are we doing this? That was really easy in the pandemic. I think it's harder for companies, including Flexport, to get that um, level of p purpose and mission to come through and what you're doing. And the further, so the more you can understand your customer, see why are you helping them? Why is supporting that mission good for the world? The better you're going to be at operating in uncertainty, having a real mission. It was so easy during the pandemic that like people were crazy hours and we were happier than ever doing it. Sure. Um, but having a sense of purpose is really, really key. Another thing that's really key is having a sense of focus and direction. You can't, you got to be able to concentrate on a list of priorities and not do everything in the world. Um, if we had been trying to do that, and, and actually this is a problem, Flexport Tower does try to do a lot of stuff. We're doing shipping to Ukraine refugees right now. There's going to be, there's food crises happening around the world. There's, you, we're never going to be able to solve all the world's problems as much as we might be able to have an impact. Yeah. We can't. So how do you say what you're going to do and not do is a really important uh, decision by leaders. And, and, you know, one of the things I've seen in times of uncertainty is that the great leaders know how to tune out a lot of stuff because a thing that yeah. can happen for people who haven't been through it is they just shut down because it's overwhelming. Yeah. There's too much happening and they literally can't operate. And some of that, I think, is just repetition. I hear in what you're yeah. saying a bunch of other things. One is that you used a different group of the organization, in your case, Flexport.org, to build this capacity for a fast OODA loop that was just this standing capacity. And so when a new crisis came up, it wasn't the first time that that group had had to deal with uncertainty. Like it's a skill you can practice. Well, and, um, and building on it, you know, one of the other pillars is re really having a, a culture of, of learning and self-improvement, constant learning. So that like actually a lot of our processes in flexport.org uh, and how we do humanitarian relief and disaster relief task force, the way we spin things up is built through not having that in place and screwing sure. it up. Um, yeah. And realizing, Hey, we, we can't just ask any people. Learns. We can't just add 50 people to a Slack channel and like expect to get good results. Like we have to oh. know who does what, how does this work? Who are we adding? What, what training do they need to have done in order to be part of the team, um, et cetera. But yeah, training is crucial to this and, and uh, running, you know, practicing, having uh, scenarios or, uh, you know, more experience. And like everybody wants to be Mark Zuckerberg where you're 18 years old and change the world. And like the reality is you probably should get a job and get some experience. Well, and, like, learn you don't have to say exactly, like, but... How old were you when you started Flexport? I was about 30, I don't know, 32 or something like that. Yeah, and I just want to say, like, that's not the myth of the Silicon Valley founder. And you'd already started in a, at least one, if not more than one, successful company. And so, yeah, that preparation, just another military concept I just want to bring in. We had uh, uh, Matthew on LinkedIn say he worked in special operations and sees the similarity. I even see, by the way, the similarity between what you're describing and fictional military operations. I don't know if you've read Ender's Game, uh, the science fiction book, but it's about this guy who goes through a training program. And But the important lesson in how they deal with uncertainty is that they break up their organization into small pieces, each one of which can, in its own module, have an, you know, an OODA loop and go after you know, those changes. And um, you know, a lot of large organizations become brittle. They become accustomed to a certain environment and all their systems grow together and then they just snap as soon as some assumption that affects one part of the system, you know, takes hold. Totally. And I think that's um, the next the next pillar of a, of a culture that's good at dealing with uncertainty is, is building trust, uh, trust with your teammates so that and whether that's uh, your boss or someone who works for you or another team that's parallel to yours, 
that you've got to believe that other people are in it for the same purpose and that everyone's going to do what they agree to. Uh, and that will follow through and you set standards and say, okay, this team is responsible for doing this task and they will do it. And you don't need to worry about that because you trust them. Um, um, a lot of organizations have no trust and they have to solve this by lots of meetings in lots of bureaucracy and lots of um, hierarchy so that because one person can't trust another person, well, then they need that person to work for them yeah. so that they can demand that they comply. Um, and this slows things down because now you can only move at the speed of the slowest member of the team uh, and everybody, instead of being able to be lots of nimble, like an Ender's game, your example you're describing, where everybody can split up and parallelize the operation because they trust each other to do their part. Most organizations fail at that. And, and you know, I'll just say that the intensity of purpose that comes in a moment of crisis, that is, I mean, in the military, it's campaigns. And those moments seem to create never having served, but very grateful to the people who have, seem to, to create a, a, a foundation of trust that lasts even during normal times and allows yep. them to work more effectively and all that. Well, stuff. exactly. And they can do things that we can't do. Like we can't take a, a bunch of our employees and like drop them into freezing cold water and torture sure. them for two weeks. It's for six, you know, six months during basically some kind of crazy training. Like, so we've got to find other ways to create bonds of trust between our teams. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I love the creative ideas to do that. I don't think, I think way too many corporate events like involve just going out and drinking and like, there's some of that that maybe build some camaraderie, but like you want to put through people through some experiences where they really, gel and yeah i mean one, one thing i'll just say for us is one of the things i've learned over the years is they don't have to be physical experiences i'm not as you know mm. physical person um but you know sometimes it's about revealing things about each other that are mm. difficult and vulnerable and really getting to know each other like that can you know that can produce a bond too the same kind of bond that you have with like good friends where you've been through something really difficult together uh, but you know i just want to say from the first time we started working together you as a learner has been one of your most obvious, you know, professional traits where it's like, you're always got a book, you know, that you're talking about. You were the first person to put me on a Maverick, the book about it, uh, the, you know, Brazilian entrepreneur. Mm. And, uh, and that's got to extend to the organization. Any other thoughts before we wrap and let you go? Yeah, back to well, the, the one, um, maybe one last pillar, I think, is a really around how do you, how, do, how does a company make decisions and um, become so crucial that you have, like your goal of your company culture, the goal of, of what we're all here for, you know, whatever your mission is, your goal is to enable people to execute with like extreme velocity in that direction. Um, and remembering that velocity is different than speed because velocity has a direction. If you study, yeah. if you remember your physics, like it has a vector. Oh, I um, like that. And that's a really key distinction because if you're going the wrong direction, speed is actually terrible. Uh, yeah, of course. And, oh. and so in some cases, the highest velocity you can achieve is to like stop and do nothing yeah. um, and, well, and right. make sure. And so they're knowing when are you in that moment where you need to stop and say, hey, let's get the right people together and make a good decision versus like all out, just go as fast as you can. Like that is a really difficult judgment. Um, it, it requires a lot of intuition. And therefore, and you're not going to have enough data. So you got to have experienced people with good judgment. And like that's, that is the reason that people get paid a lot of money in this world. And it's not okay. easy at all. And it's so, you kind of only know later if you make good decisions or not. Um, but you get to observe and, for the next loop. And it's, yeah, totally. And you keep, you keep learning and keep, and like a lot of decisions are, you're much better off just making a quick decision and just take some action and you'll figure it out on the next loop around. Some things, and this is uh, Bezos' whole type one versus type two decisions is a one way door and you can't come back or is it a two-way door and you can just like, Hey, go quickly. Um, but we, we, we use a decision-making framework at Flexport called rapid, uh, which actually comes from Bain, I think, but it's, it's, it's very simple. The idea is that in advance of the decision, you just say who's going to do, who's going to play what role here. And only one decision maker is allowed. That's the D. Uh, and by being very, very clear about who the decision maker is, you empower that person. They don't have to please everybody. They can just make a decision and everybody else who's providing input, to the decision can feel heard without feeling offended that they didn't get their oh, way. Because they know explicitly um, where the power lies. Let me ask a leadership question of you because I think I know the answer to this. But when you are involved in a rapid process, how often mm -hmm. are you the decision maker? Are you always the D or not always the D? Um, well, so the way the way that it should work in pr in principle is that uh, you know you ask everybody. Anybody can be an R. Anybody can make a recommendation. Uh, please do right if you have ways to, ways yeah. to improve. Uh, tell us. Then, but you have to keep asking if you if you're that person, you have an idea. 
you say, who is the D, who is the D over and over again? And so you get, the, if everybody agrees there's a decision maker and just go to that person, they can make the decision. Many, many cases it's un, unclear. Uh, and then and then the way it'll work is you take, okay, if I've got two different people who are told that they're, I'm being told these two different people are the D or they're both claiming it. Well, then by default, it goes wherever in the org chart those two people meet, that person becomes the D. In many, many cases, that's me because I'm where many of the orgs meet. Uh, what I try to do is I don't like to make decisions unless they're the really important things. So I'll appoint somebody else and say, no, you're the D uh, and delegate them. And then what we need to do is update our list of areas of responsibility. And that person's now the D for this type of I love that. question. Yeah. And you just maintain that big list of areas of responsibility. So it, over, as you run this process, you get better at better at defining who the decision makers are. By, by the way, by documenting this, you can also uh, see who's good at making decisions over time. Oh, I and love that. Is, yeah, the sense. hardest thing, is, that. the hardest thing in these companies is um, building the trust and the experience required to make good decisions and execute and and lead people in a world where you have twenty percent. The the tech industry average is twenty percent attrition, so you're losing one out of five people. You turn over your whole team every five years on average. Uh, very, very difficult to build something enduring and lasting. And, um, you know, I think if um, a, a military that did that would fail. Yeah, it, it no would be question. very, very hard if you didn't have professional, uh, uh, you know, a cohort of professional officers who've been there for 20 years, have seen combat, have seen every experience, like have good judgment built up over um, hard fought times. And so I'm very envious of uh, some of the older tech companies that have figured this out and have like a lot of tenure in their senior ranks. And we, sure. you know, no, we've got a lot of that. turnover. I, feel like I regularly get an email that's like, here are all the people celebrating their 30th anniversary in the company and that kind of thing. And, it's a you know, huge advantage that these companies yeah. have. Now um, you've got to also create ways for young people to come in and got new, not young people, new people to come in with new ideas and stuff. So that's the hard pro problem of building these companies. But. Well, here's to doing the many decades later look with Flexport. And we're going to write up all these principles for people who want to see this and past episodes. The video comes up pretty quick and then we'll do um, write-ups that can be edited by anybody in the community. This is not advice.work, a crowdsourced guide on how to work. And Ryan, I just, you know, for everything and including sharing the wisdom here, thank you and to be continued. All right. Thanks, Roy. Thanks to the whole Bloomberg beta team and uh, everybody out there. We'll talk to you soon.